you know, we've been making images for 30,000 years that we know of, which is twice as long as we've had written language. And I take the view that if we've been doing it consistently for that long, there must be a reason why we need to do it. And I've always been interested in that problem. Why is it, why do we need to make images? What do they do for us? Um, it's not just a frivolous activity to decorate your home. It's something much more uh, important than that. And when you talk to any living artist, you realize that the need to do it is very strong. It's almost like an addiction. You know, an artist starts making something. If you listen to what Dubuffet says about his work or Francis Bacon or any great artist, you realize that the compulsion to make art is powerful. And they may take some momentary satisfaction in what they do, um, but it's short-lived because they're almost immediately wanting to go back and do more. Because whatever problems are resolved in one work, it's never enough. It's never complete. And I wanted to find out more of what that's about. So it's been a lifelong long interest. My father was a psychoanalyst. My mother was a painter. That's kind of where this came from, I guess. Um, so I've always been interested in that kind of social dimension of works of art. What is it, why does a society need works of art? Um, you know, why do I think they're as important as I think they are? Um, and I don't think we've ever gotten very good answers in public about why we need works of art. And, and I think as a culture, in America in particular, we've neglected the arts. And I've had a whole career writing about living artists, um, uh, writing art history mostly about the 20th century. Um, I've always been interested in children's drawings, in, partly, in part for this reason, because with children you can see that um, a kind of primitive urge to make images and you understand a lot about how, the, how it functions in relation to their sense of themselves. You know, artists like children, and I think I learned this by looking at children's drawings, artists are also trying to make sense of their experience. I just, um, there's a, a book of mine that just came out called A Troublesome Subject, The Art of Robert Arneson, which is really an effort to understand how an artist can use their work to articulate the emerging reality of their historical and social moment. This was a great opportunity. I really have, I really owe a, a, a big debt to J.B. Milliken, you know, the president of the University of Nebraska, who said to me, you know, come here and give these lectures and write them up and we'll publish them. And um, it gave me a chance to theorize in a way my whole career of 35 years of thinking about these problems and to, and to look at the big picture and ask myself, you know, how, uh, how this really works, what art really does. And so these lectures begin with iconography. They start out with uh, the first lecture is really focused on Robert Motherwell. And I tried in each case to pick one or two artists to kind of focus my, my investigation of a particular question. The first question was about the way in which abstract form can have a very specific meaning, uh, an iconography that is as specific as representation. Uh, right when I finished my PhD um, in 1975, I had um, become good friends with Motherwell. And so we had these uh, wonderful conversations over a number of years. And as I got to know him better and better, I realized that the abstract forms in his paintings correlated very specifically with events in his life and particular constellations of emotions. And over time, I began to realize that I could articulate a, a, an iconography for his abstraction um, that was very specific. Once I'd solved that problem for myself, the next question was, how do you create a grammar of those forms? And that's what Freud said you never could do. He said visual thinking is a very incomplete form of thinking because you can't really articulate a grammar of the parts. And um, I think any artist knows he's wrong. And I think probably in some level he knew he was wrong. I think it was frightening to him because it was too out of control. It was too much a direct opening of the unconscious. And there I chose Miro and Calder because um, at one, in the late 20s, um, Calder went for the first time to Miro's studio in Paris. And um, he says, he's looking at one thing he describes, he says just a big blank white canvas and it has a hat pin and a feather and a cork stuck in it and that's all there is. And he said it just isn't art. But it really bothered him. And what I began to realize that these two artists who were lifelong friends, who really had a deep friendship at, right after that meeting um, that lasted the rest of their lives, communicated with each other not really in language but across their materials. 
And it was an opportunity for me to think about how that grammar worked. You know, how is it that you can articulate something that's meaningful to somebody else with abstract forms? The third lecture, I thought, well, if I can talk about the meaning of abstract uh, images and I can talk about how the grammar works, uh, then that means that we can talk about the political implications of a work of art on a much deeper level. It's not about the illustration of a political theme. It's not whether you draw a portrait of Lenin in your mural. It's about changing a sensibility in the viewer, that you look at something and it kind of opens up something in you that allows you to reorganize your experience, just like children do in drawing. So the third lecture is about art and politics and the way in which a work of art using this grammar can open up the unconscious. Um, it allows an artist to consciously work on a work of art and reorganize uh, its symbolic meaning and then effectively reintroject it into the unconscious as an organizing principle. The fourth lecture um, is really about what, this, what happens in the human brain? In what ways does this actually change the wiring of the brain, or does it? Um, and that I wasn't so sure I could do. Um, so my, my arrangement with the president of the university here was, I said, I'll come give these lectures. I'm going to give, give them one at a time. And when I'm there, I'll spend a week um, working with the art historians and teaching. And, but I want to spend, uh, each one of these visits, I want to spend a day with your neuroscientists at the medical center. Um, and you got to open the door for me, which he did. So when I first went in there, I think they were all very skeptical, like, you know, what am I doing here? And, you know, this is going to be a huge waste of their time. And we started having these conversations. And I think pretty quickly they realized uh, that there was something interesting for them, although none of us quite knew where it would go. And I think I did get where I needed to go with this fourth lecture, which is to understand um, what is the evolutionary argument uh, in, the human, in terms of the human brain of uh, why we need works of art and what they do for us. How does it really affect our, the wiring of the brain?